Psychedelics and Ontology, by yours truly, Jerry Kavosnika, published by the Universal Institute of Applied Ontology in 1972. When I was living in Colorado Springs, I noted that the difficulty with the various approaches to the problem of drug abuse in that city is that none of them has dealt adequately with the underlying reasons for the use of drugs by young people or with the question of alternatives to drug use. If there is to be anything more than the treatment of symptoms, consideration must be given to these areas. The root causes of the drug problem, and here I am speaking particularly of psychedelic drugs, are to be found in relation to the identity crisis presently being experienced by those in a drug subculture, which is part of a larger subculture that I call the new generation. This identity crisis has both a social and an individual aspect to be considered. Taking first the social aspect, the type of society which young people find that they are expected to endorse and somehow find their place in, is a major factor in contributing to the use of psychedelic drugs. It's not so much the visible manifestations of the social problems of war, poverty, population increase, and pollution, as it is the underlying attitudes and values of Western life and culture that have led to the desire by many young people to escape society through drugs or some other expedient. Drug use is a manifestation of the search for a new social identity. It is a means by which young people attempt to find and establish their own society in the midst of the larger society in which they still, by necessity, must operate. The positive achievements of Western science and technology have been obtained at the cost of reinforcing patterns of material accumulation and isolation from nature. A type of man is emerging which bears an increasing resemblance to the machines which technology has enabled him to fashion. And so it is against this trend in Western civilization that the new generation is rebelling. In the midst of a dominant culture, which in their eyes is tending toward artificiality, sterility, and extravagance, the new generation is attempting to establish its own separate identity. Long hair, rock music, and the use of psychedelic drugs are some of the symbols of this new identity. The net result of the so-called American way of life has been an emphasis on externals to the gradual exclusion of an inner life. And so it is now assumed that the purpose of life is to acquire as much as possible from the environment, whether it be in the form of money, property, status, scientific knowledge, pleasure, etc. And if the inner life refuses to cooperate with this extroverted vision, it is whipped into line by means of alcohol, tranquilizer, psychoanalysis, religion, or some other import from the outside. This brings us to the individual basis for drug use, which of course is directly related to the social matrix in which a person develops and matures. Every individual has an inner longing to know who he is to experience the reality of his own being. Until he comes to himself, that is, until he discovers his own identity and his relation to the rest of the universe, he will remain empty and unfulfilled. He will continue to experience a gnawing at the heart, even though he may succeed in temporarily allaying this pain with the aid of various narcotics, things, money, power, knowledge, security, etc., from the environment. Some individuals are conditioned to the point of believing that their fulfillment does, in fact, lie outside of themselves, that their identity is the sum total of what they can get from the world around them, and so they spend their whole lives trying to manufacture and maintain environments in which they think 
they can be happy. But increasing numbers of people, particularly those of the new generation, are beginning to sense the futility of this approach. The disintegrating world around them is evidence enough that it doesn't work. The various careers and lifestyles offered by the so-called corporate state do not measure up to even the lowest estimates of their own worth and integrity. So rather than selling out for what strikes them as a mess of pottage, they are dropping out of the social and economic mainstream to conduct the search for themselves in other areas. And the various subcultures within the new generation roughly correspond to the different forms which this search is taking. Certain activities, objects, and patterns of life are adopted for varying lengths of time in the quest for meaning. There is first of all what I would call the revolutionary subculture, with its emphasis on political and social action, operating on the assumption that a new identity can only emerge in the context of radical changes in the external world, great numbers of young adults have espoused the causes of minorities, protested U.S. involvement in Vietnam, and crusaded for ecology and population control. And then the communal movement is characterized by withdrawal from the patterns of urban life to evolve new family units where the concern is with authentic personal relationships and doing things together. Identity is related to experiences of sharing and intimate association on a daily basis over a long period of time. In the depth of involvement with other people, a person seeks the key that will unlock the doors to himself. And then we have current trends that indicate a revival of interest in religion, not so much in the institutional rational religions of the West, as in the mystical, introverted religions of the East. The disciplines of Zen Buddhism and various forms of yoga are particularly popular, and in addition, Christianity is making a comeback in certain areas in the emotional intensity of Pentecostalism and the Jesus movement. And then we have the psychedelic subculture, which probably is the largest and most significant segment of the new generation. Now, psychedelic literally means that which has the quality of alluring and enticing the soul, and it embraces far more than the phenomena known as psychedelic drugs. There is psychedelic music, psychedelic art, psychedelic cookery. There are psychedelic crafts, psychedelic styles and fashions, and psychedelic sanctuaries equipped with strobe lights, black lights, black light posters, candles, and incense. The primary objective in all of this is experience, an experience of increased life, an experience which provides some clue to identity. And for this experience, a youthful explorer will sometimes take considerable liberties with his mind and bodies. A generation which has been conditioned to rely upon the capacity of assorted labor-saving devices to quickly produce a given result may be quite open to the possibility of achieving instant euphoria and instant enlightenment by the simple expedient of swallowing a pill. The idea that mood-altering agents and methods not only exist but actually work has been reinforced by the extensive use of depressants and stimulants on the part of the so-called older generation. So with this as their orientation, it should not be particularly surprising that many young people have turned to psychedelics as a means of locating that which seems to be missing in their own experience and that of society in general. One prominent psychologist described them as, quote, Western man shortcut to the God of the East, unquote. An individual who is either unaware of or unafraid of the dangers of psychedelics 
will often attempt to use these drugs as a shortcut to the experience of nirvana, as a way of breaking into the subconscious levels of mind, or, as is usually the case in the initial stages of drug use, merely as a way of experiencing something different to what is offered in the context of everyday life in society. But I'm afraid psychedelics do not measure up to their expectations. There are, in fact, no shortcuts to a consistent experience of fulfillment. While some recognize this rather quickly and move on to something new, others tarry longer in psychedelia and emerge only after sustaining various degrees of psychological or physiological impairment. Still others pursue psychedelics or hard narcotics, such as heroin and opium, as a part of a descent into oblivion. The misfortunes of drug abuse are frequently explainable in terms of a lack of knowledge concerning alternatives. It is assumed that as experience, which has the quality of alluring and enticing the soul, can only come by the way of psychedelic drugs and related psychedelic paraphernalia, this, therefore, is the only way to go. There are those, in consequence, who actually prefer suicide by psychedelics to slow death on the deserts of modern civilization. None of the techniques and methods employed by the new generation to solve the identity crisis can succeed in the long run. The traveler may advance a few steps along the way, but in essence he remains lost. There is, however, a road which goes directly home to the truth of identity. It is well-lighted, well-marked, and increasingly well-traveled. But before describing this road, particularly in relation to the drug problem, something more needs to be said about the nature of the psychedelic experience and the reasons why psychedelics are ultimately a dead end. My own experience with the use of psychedelics has convinced me that they can, under certain conditions and for a limited period of time, catalyze experience of profound bliss and heightened sensitivity. The unconscious mind is a great repository of archetypal images, race memories, and occult powers. During a psychedelic drug trip, material from the unconscious erupts into the conscious mind and sometimes beyond it in the form of hallucinations. There is at times a feeling that one is entering the secret place of the Most High, that the images and feelings are sacred in character, that one is standing in the presence of God. Because of this, I often interpreted such experiences as having profound meaning and significance. The ego eye, or conscious mind, tends to dissipate during a psychedelic drug trip to permit a greater release of energy from the psychic centers activated by the drug. The human ego is nothing in reality but the artificial construct of social conditioning and role-playing, a parasitical accretion which feeds on the life force of true being. Incidentally, the pettiness, indeed the nothingness, of the human ego is often one of the first facts to be noted by the psychedelic adventurer with its dead weight temporarily removed, stored up life force is suddenly released into the body, the emotions, and the whole environment surrounding the individual. People and objects begin to emit a psychedelic glow. The natural world of animals and trees, rivers and mountains, is perceived as restored to the vibrancy and luminosity of paradise. By choice, I spent many psychedelic trips, especially during the summer, outside in communion with nature. Most memorable in this regard was my first experience with a psychedelic drug called mescaline at a weekend retreat in Aspen, Colorado. 
There, by the edge of a swiftly running stream, surrounded by the towering peaks of the Rocky Mountains, I experienced ecstasy a million times, the maroon bells, awe-inspiring in almost any state of awareness, were almost overpowering in their beauty and magnificence. They appeared as the most holy temples of God, the focal point of cosmic power and glory. Another nature trip, though quite different in character, occurred at Princeton, New Jersey. On a hot and rainy summer day, Walking through the almost jungle-like foliage, smoking marijuana, I experienced in my own being the reality of photosynthesis. It could almost be described as an act of copulation with nature. There was a feeling of union with the elemental processes of growth and reproduction, as the vital fluids moving through the vines and trees were felt as moving through my own body. As this glorious reconciliation with nature grew to completeness, I experienced an equally glorious reconciliation within my own being, a blissful reunion with my own long-submerged sensuality, an awakening to the full import of being one with the earth. Isolated from nature, I had been isolated from a part of myself, our reunion brought forth a mighty urge, a desire from within. Long smoldering impulses and drives now craved expression. New worlds took form within me as life revealed itself in a fresh and delightfully unexpected way. The majority of my psychedelic trips were spent listening to music. It might be said that psychedelics opened up the whole world of music to me. Under the influence of a psychedelic drug, sounds which are ordinarily filtered through a rather coarse perceptual maze move more directly upon the centers of awareness to create a sensation of identity between music and listener. Nuances of sound and subtle variations in rhythm and beat which under ordinary circumstances might escape notice, are quite readily perceived in a state of psychedelic awareness. The music, though coming from the outside, strikes responsive chords within, so that there is quite often a feeling that it is coming from the depths of being. I will always remember the night when I smoked a substantial quantity of hashish, and listened to Stravinsky's Firebird Ballet with headphones. No superlatives can do justice to the experience. All of the violence and pathos of the ages swept through my soul. Energy rushes of hurricane force split and scattered the worlds within me until nothing was left but the nakedness of being. Similar things could be said with respect to people. There were times when I felt I was looking directly into the mind of another person, knowing in essence what previously had only been known in form. There was a feeling of intimacy, of kinship, at times even a feeling of absolute oneness with others. The walls of separation seemed to break down, and love of people and love of life prevailed over all. These are but a few of the hundreds of powerful and provocative experiences for which psychedelic drugs were the catalyst. In most instances, the experience was one of euphoria, of profound well-being, of joyful reverence before the beauty and mystery of life. In the restored state of youth and innocence, I spent eternities exploring the enhanced forests of my own imagination. Again and again, the fall of man was reversed, and the experience of delightful homecoming, the return to the garden, was the profound experience. But there were times, and these times occurred with increasing frequency, when a negative pattern originating in the subconscious mind 
or moving through me from the environment would result in a psychedelic drug experience that was anything but pleasant. Sometimes the material filtering up from the subconscious mind represented some deep-seated insecurity or personal resentment. There were terrifying moments when the waters let loose from the subconscious were filled with the most sickening garbage and deadly poisons. In times of emotional crisis, when destructive waters churn in the subconscious depths of mind, the conscious levels are needed to keep an individual on course. But under the influence of a powerful psychedelic drug, the navigational equipment represented by the conscious mind is, for the most part, dumped overboard, leaving the individual completely at the mercy of the floodwaters moving through him. As indicated earlier, the conscious aspect of the mind, when burdened with the cares of the world and considered the seat of personal identity, may prevent a person from realizing the depths of inner being. It is the prison guard which holds a person in the cell of his conditioned self. But in another sense, the conscious mind functions as a guardian angel, spreading a protective net around the delicate emotional fabric, vigilantly warding off anything that would disturb and defile the holy place within. When tempests rage in the deeper levels of the self, when the waves of environmental tumult rise higher, the conscious mind may at least keep the vessel from overturning. Summoning the memory, it can remind a person that no matter what he may be experiencing in the moment, in essence, he is something beautiful and indestructible. But of course, the control function of the conscious mind is forfeited under the influence of a powerful psychedelic drug. There is no longer a capacity to foresee the consequences of an action or to weigh realistically the impulses filtering up from the subconscious mind. The person is, to a large extent, incapable of rational judgment should the necessity arise. There is a tendency for the attention to become fixated on an object or movement so that things are no longer seen in terms of their practical and logical relationships to each other. But, most seriously of all, with nothing to remind a person of his unbroken connection with the power of life, he is rendered virtually defenseless against the seductions of death. As he capitulates to the demons which he has allowed to be resurrected from the graveyard of his subconscious mind, his faculties are ripped apart and scattered from sea to sea. Now it must be said in passing, because so many have misunderstood this point, that negative patterns and destructive emotions are not brought into the mind by the drug, as if the drug itself were a conglomerate of emotions and programmed experiences. The psychedelic drug acts only as a catalyst loosening the protective cover of the mind and bringing forth that which, though buried in the subconscious mind, is nevertheless already present. This is why a person should be especially leery of taking a psychedelic drug to overcome a state of depression. Instead of escaping from it, he may find himself staring it right in the face, and if he is not tuned in to the resources within himself, that would enable him to cope with it, he may be traumatized by inner conflict and anxiety. Many bad trips have resulted from the erroneous supposition that a psychedelic drug automatically turns gloom into elation, automatically brings order out of a chaotic emotional state. Just as certain evils have been wrongly attributed to psychedelics, so have certain powers been wrongly attributed to these drugs. No psychedelic drug 
has in and of itself the power to produce something beautiful where something ugly is being experienced. If joy is brought into the experience, joy is increased. If fear is brought, fear is increased. Psychedelics simply increase the velocity of whatever is moving through mind and heart. But there is a great danger here. On a steam pressure cooker, there is a safety valve which lets out the steam in the cooker a little bit at a time. If there were no such valve, the steam and boiling water in the cooker would explode all over a person when he removed the lid. Pressure building up in the subconscious mind, in other words, needs to be drained off slowly, lest the mind be devastated by a sudden explosion. There is such a thing as a natural clearing process, a gradual process of draining which allows the personality to remain basically intact. A powerful psychedelic drug, in suddenly lifting the lid from the subconscious mind, may overwhelm a person with a flood of material accumulated from the destructive patterns of the past. Moreover, because the destructive material is released in such magnitude and intensity, there is a tendency to identify with it, to claim it as one's own. The person, since he is experiencing nothing else, is tempted to think that he is what he is experiencing. He may think that he is witnessing his own disintegration in an ultimate sense. The result is panic and a vicious circle of anxiety and self-destruction. On the evening of a particularly cold and dreary day, with only three hours of sleep the night before, and suffering from a mildly upset stomach, I dropped what was, for me, an enormous quantity of LSD, and went to a movie confident that this happy combination would put me out of my misery and into the same state of exhilaration that I had become accustomed to experiencing on an LSD trip. The movie I elected to see was Midnight Cowboy. As the drug began to take effect, blood splashed on the screen and a dead body arrived in Florida. These things were difficult to regard with detached amusement. No one could have convinced me at the time that they were merely happening on a movie screen. For me, they were real in an absolute sense. Life all of a sudden was nothing but a bed of pain and despair, tending toward death, which inevitably wins in the end. I had the urge to run out of the theater screaming, but I somehow maintained until the film was over. Back at the house where I lived, I fought desperately to get into music, hoping that in this way I would be released from the vicious circle of negativity which had overtaken me. But neither I nor the friend who was with me at the time could get the stereo to work. The grating of the needle on the record corresponded to the murderous grinding and grating of the mangled parts in my brain. So in a frenzy of terror, I dashed up to my room, experiencing the unspeakable dread of knowing that my mind was about to snap and that I was powerless to do anything about it. Madly pacing back and forth, I felt like a helpless rat receiving shock treatment in a treadmill. My efforts to think of something beautiful and pleasant were unable to erase the vivid impressions of the film I had just seen. The wretchedness and filth of the New York City ghetto, human beings wallowing in excrement and vomit, beating, stabbing, and shooting each other, life nothing but a painful process of dying. There was the frightening experience of becoming completely at the mercy of the demonic forces beyond my control, a feeling of having lost any grip which I once had on myself. 
having invested heavily in the human ego, I experienced its disintegration as my disintegration. Accustomed as I had been to relying upon the conditioned mind for control, the loss of the conditioned mind was experienced as a loss of control, a loss of any hold I had on reality, a loss of life itself. I desperately wanted to run to escape from that which was holding and strangling me. But the most terrifying realization of all was that I could not escape, that a change of scene would not do the trick, that no matter where I went or what I did, the unrelenting demon within me would continue to rip at the flesh of my mind. As the trip progressed, I used what little I had left of my rational mind in a frantic effort to talk myself down. Looking at the clock, I tried to convince myself that the peak of the trip had been reached and that soon the drug would be releasing its hold on me. In the beginning of the trip, I was apt to blame the drug and the pusher who sold it to me for the hell that I was experiencing. Now, Henry told me that these tablets have a uniform number of micrograms, but I'll swear that this LSD is ten times the potency of anything I've ever taken, and it's probably contaminated with something. Why else would I be experiencing this madness? If I live through this night, Henry is going to have to answer for what he has done to me. But later it began to dawn on me that the bad trip was of my own making. There was no reason to believe that this particular tablet of LSD was any different from any other of the 24 tablets in the purchase. The only thing different about this trip was the state of mind I had brought to it and the influences to which I had exposed myself during the trip. I am the helpless victim of a negative pattern, but this pattern originated in my own mind and grew in strength as I identified with it and flew into a state of panic. This trip is a psychological, not a biological phenomenon. It is simply thrusting to the surface that which lay smoldering in my subconscious mind. It is revealing how insecure I am. For were I really secure in myself, I would not be experiencing this feeling of profound insecurity, of utter rootlessness, of being completely at the mercy of strange and sinister forces of my own making, the fabrications of my own confusion. Relax, relax, Jerry, my friend was urging me. Don't fight it. That's your problem. And how right he was. Intuitively, I knew that if I relaxed, the floodwaters would recede and a state of tranquility would gradually return. But can a businessman relax as he watches the fortune which he has amassed over a long period of years disappear under a mound of ticker tape? Can a mother relax when her child, to whom she has devoted her whole life, is in imminent danger? Who can relax as he watches the destruction of that which he has been intimately identified with for much of his life just suddenly disappear? The impulse is to fight back, to somehow retain a hold on that which is disintegrating. Just as the captain of a ship will sometimes prefer to go down with his sinking ship, so it was with me. As I witnessed the disintegration of my own ego, the thing with, with which I had so intricately linked my life, I tightened my grip on it, and in so doing, experienced even more devastation. But I could not let go. For having no knowledge of alternative securities, letting go seemed equivalent to letting go of life itself. But in something of a determined effort, I began to breathe easier, to relax, to let go. The moment that I did this, the objects around me, indeed the whole physical world, began to recede, and I experienced the sensation of being lifted up from the floor to the ceiling, lofted, as it were, clear out of the room, 
and up into the heavens. Then came the jolting awareness that I was actually breaking loose from my own physical body, that some mighty and mysterious force was pulling a part of me, was it my soul, out of my body in which it had comfortably resided for 27 years. There was a fleeting impulse to float away into nothingness, achieving escape by dissipating into the atmosphere. Well, I mentioned this to the friend who was with me. I told him I wanted to leap from my second-floor balcony into the blessed coolness and serenity of space. When he cautioned me against this, I felt like saying to him, Man, you just don't understand. I can fly. Well, his efforts to restrain me from this resolve immediately brought back all of the restraints, all of the inhibitions, all of the fears that I had been contending with a few moments before. The possibility of separating from my body, of disintegrating into space, of surrendering my individual identity to nothingness, now struck me with supreme horror. God forgive me for ever considering such a thing. To lose myself is surely to lose all. Take me back, please take me back, good world of sanity. Let me feel once again the warm embrace of reality. And so tightening my grip, I once again fought desperately to hold myself together. For by virtue of my mind-body identification, this seemed to be the only way of preserving my life. I also fought desperately to get back to the earth which seemed to be receding from me, taking hold of various objects in the room, not just with my hands, but with all of the self at my command. I clung to them as tenaciously as an ocean crab clings to its prey, by immersing and, in fact, losing myself in the objects around me, the substantial things of the earth. I sought to return to that of which I thought reality consisted. With all the power I could summon, I resisted the force that was pulling at me, pulling me into unfamiliar realms of shadows and phantoms. As if these things were not enough to bring me to the edge of a complete mental and physical breakdown, there was also the factor of guilt, a feeling of having betrayed my family, betrayed my own being, betrayed my God. This guilt and anxiety was felt acutely in relation to my parents. If my mind did crack under the terrible strain of this trip, if there was need to be confined to a mental hospital, what of them? What of their reputation? What of their opinion of me? Knowing of their deep love for me, I had the terrible suspicion that they would probably crack up too, that I, in other words, was taking others with me down the road to ruin. Therefore, I felt I just had to maintain. I must hold on. I could not under any circumstances allow them to know what was happening to me, either by directly summoning their help or by having someone else take me to the hospital, which I realized would inevitably involve them. So I knew I absolutely had to emerge from this nightmare under my own power. But the life-or-death pressure which this view of the situation created only succeeded in making me more hysterical. And there was also the tremendous weight of guilt arising in part from the thoroughness of my own conditioning in the patterns of the Christian religion. I felt that I had violated the sanctity of my own body, the temple of God, and had literally sold my mind for what I hoped would be a few moments of pleasure. For this carelessness and irresponsibility toward the capacities of body and mind which I held in trust for God, I thought I deserved to die. It occurred to me that the bad trip was only my just and deserved punishment for transgressing, indeed mocking, the will of God. And how embarrassing it was to have two close friends beside me as I writhed in agony 
on my bed, especially when they needed to dissuade me from violence and restrain me from jumping out the window. The one self-assured individualist had become weak and helpless, a raving lunatic, a laughing stock, screaming, whispering, laughing, crying, blessing, cursing, living, dying. What a spectacle I must have made of myself. How can I ever face my friends again, myself again, my God again? Then... After what seemed to be an eternity of torture in this self-made inferno of my mind, things began to gradually come back into perspective. The conscious mind returned as a returning lover, and there was a glorious feeling of coming home to the earth. In an external sense, this was accomplished by simply taking a shower. Immersing my body in water, I at the same time immersed my consciousness in the reality of a simple experience and became pleasantly connected with the things of the earth. Profound involvement with soap and a wash rag saved my life. This bad trip, which I have described in some detail, is presented as an example of what may happen as a result of opening the mind with a psychedelic drug. My particular experience followed inevitably from the combination of external circumstances, emotional currents, and eruptions of the subconscious which characterized the trip. Every psychedelic trip is different because in every case, Different psychological and, and environmental factors are in operation. The possibility of a bad trip exists for everyone. The character and intensity of the trip will depend on the individual psychological state and the environmental and vibrational factors influencing and interacting with it. A bad psychedelic trip is generally attended by a feeling of profound insecurity. There is the experience of a loss of control at certain points, of an absence of what the individual feels he needs to hold things together, what a person has looked to for identity, for meaning, for significance, when this is threatened, and because he is identified with it, this threat is experienced as a threat to life itself, to the individual himself. In my case, there was a mind-body identification. In the case of a girl I knew, there was an emotional identification. Her life virtually rose and fell with her emotions. A bad trip for her was often the result of the dominance of a negative emotional pattern or of a complete scattering of her emotions so that there was no longer any sense of control. Then another girl of my acquaintance was very much oriented to other people and acutely sensitive to their vibrations. She could not experience a pleasant trip in a house full of bad vibrations or around people who were experiencing hatred, resentment, and bitterness. So identified was she with the vibrational character of her environment that the slightest change in it could churn up a devastating hurricane in her mind. And so a bad psychedelic trip is usually experienced as the loss or the threatened loss of that in which a person has placed his or her trust. There is a feeling of being vulnerable, of being unable to defend oneself against the strange forces attracting the fortress of personal security erected by the ego to cope with the problems of life. The shattering of the fortress, the final surrender of control to the enemy, the sudden and complete loss of former identifications is experienced as an inner cataclysm, a mighty shaking of the foundations and in some cases as disintegration and death. The control factors operative in a person's life, the building blocks of his house of being, are provided in large measure by the society in which he lives. 
The experiences of life shape and condition the mind in accordance with the patterns and values which are dominant in the culture out of which the experiences come. A bad trip is, perhaps even in a majority of instances, more a reflection upon the accepted traditions and values of the society in which the individual develops than upon the individual himself. If a person is taught and otherwise pressured throughout his life to adopt values, principles, and purposes which are out of line with the true nature of life, then a bad trip may be experienced as a conflict between the false identification patterns of the conditioned mind and the stirred-up life forces that are attempting to pierce the veil of conditioning. A person will cling to his conditioned mind because, in doing so, he thinks he is clinging to himself. Temptations to release it and accept a new self-understanding are regarded as coming from the devil, from a variety of demonic forces, from the, quote, lower self, or from some ugly or sordid source, perhaps even a communist conspiracy. There is likely to be a tremendous and sometimes overwhelming sense of guilt as the individual feels himself attracted to that which seems to contradict everything that has been drilled into his head from youth, the sacred code by which he feels he must live because it carries the blessing of his parents, his teachers, his television set, the morning newspaper, the reader's digest, and many other sources. Born and raised in the midst of social insanity, he is likely to interpret his return to sanity as the experience of going insane. He may feel by virtue of his past conditioning that he is losing his mind when in actuality he is finding it. When a narcotic is withdrawn from an addict, it may kill him. The values and patterns of life in present-day society comprise the narcotic on which almost everyone has come to depend. When this narcotic is taken away, as it tends to be on a psychedelic trip, a painful and sometimes agonizing withdrawal may ensue. It is easily seen from this that a bad trip is quite frequently nothing but a measure of the strength of an individual's addiction to the hard narcotics of his society and culture, to the opinions of an unreal world, the opiates of that world. For a psychedelic drug literally forces him to do without the narcotic of his conditioned mind without the tried and trusted classification system which he has learned to live with. The individual who has become accustomed to perceiving life through the rose-colored glasses of his conditioned mind may be unable to cope with the experience of having those glasses removed. He will fight to keep them on, and failing this, he will try desperately to perceive things as though he still had them on. A man confined to a dungeon for 30 years might well be overwhelmed by the experience of light, not to mention the experience of freedom. There were numerous occasions on a psychedelic trip when I experienced the discomfort and sometimes the horror of being too high. Objects and people around me seemed to explode into my mind. Normally docile sense impressions riddled my capacities of perception in an unrelenting bombardment, the steady stream of psychedelic sensations imposing themselves upon my ordinarily clouded state of awareness and the intensity of the vibrational currents moving through me gave rise to the dread that my mind was about to blow a fuse. Things were just too heavy. The soft mist became a torrential rain that threatened to drown me. There is a sense in which psychedelic drugs do indeed increase the capacity for experience. The number and intensity of the stimuli activating the mind is considerably increased, but there is a limit to how much the human mind can experience at any one time. There is a point at which the material coming into the mind surpasses the mind's capacity to assimilate it. This is the point of a freak-out, the point of destruction, 
the point of permanent psychosis. All hell breaks loose, and life is never the same again. Every time a person drops a psychedelic drug, he takes a risk that is not easily calculated. The number and complexity of the factors that need to be taken into account make any attempt to predict the nature of the trip almost impossible. The situation could be compared to boarding an airliner with no knowledge of the destination or the weather conditions and terrain along the way. The passenger may be taken through a glorious new world full of beautiful sights and pleasant experiences. Or, on the other hand, he may encounter a menacing storm that threatens to destroy him. Nor do the odds of experiencing a good trip admit of easy determination. I used to suggest the following control factors to those who were anticipating a psychedelic experience. Number one, a reasonably stable mind. Two, a congenial environment. Three, pleasant and trustworthy trip mates and guides. Four, drugs that are reliable in quality. If each of these factors checked out positive, then I felt safe in giving assurance of a good trip. But in the first place, it is very difficult to determine whether these requirements are met, especially number one, a reasonably stable mind. And secondly, even if they should check out other factors and chance occurrences, seemingly minute things which are nevertheless beyond the control of the user, may initiate a chain reaction which can change the entire direction of the trip. A single bad note or a wrong movement can whip up a ruinous whirlwind. But in addition to all of these considerations which relate to the nature of the psychedelic experience itself, there are various practical considerations that dictate against the use of a psychedelic drug there is, for instance, the matter of physical health. The physical effects of a psychedelic drug have not been precisely determined, but that there are such effects, possibly very harmful effects, is obvious from the significant changes which occur in the mind during a psychedelic experience and the actual instances of physical deterioration reported by and observed in psychedelic drug users. Reason suggests that an experience which involves such a powerful pull on the mind may well result in the destruction of brain cells. Whether the emotions experienced are excitement and elation, or terror and anxiety, there are bound to be extraordinary physical and biological consequences. This is especially the case with frequent or prolonged use. The delicate systems of the body are easily upset. The physical organism contains a vast network of energy stores. Nature's wise regulation of the storage and release of energy is accomplished principally through the endocrine glands and the hypothalamic switchboard in the brain. Although the actual mechanics of the process are unknown, psychedelic drugs precipitate chemical reactions which unlock the body's energy stores, bypassing nature's guardians and introducing elements of disturbance into the glandular orchestra. Repeated robbing and squandering of these substances may result in a state of physical depletion experienced subjectively as heaviness, despondency, boredom, and despair. The physical effects, of course, will vary with the individual. The drugs are likely to aggravate any physical difficulty which a person is already experiencing, and powerful psychedelics should certainly not be used by a woman during pregnancy. In my own case, a psychedelic trip would almost always result in a loss of appetite, a loss of sleep, an increase in pulse rate, a mild headache, nausea, and when the experience was over, a feeling of being drained of all physical and mental energy. One of the most 
painful experiences involved a tablet of LSD, which was cut with strychnine. Since LSD increases the capacity for pain as well as pleasure, the acute stomach pain and headache engendered by the strychnine was almost unbearable. On numerous occasions, friends of mine reported that LSD which they had used was either cut with speed or was nothing but speed. In addition, there were times when a tablet of LSD or a capsule of mescaline contained greater quantities of the drug than was alleged at purchase. When a person who is prepared to experience a particular kind of psychedelic trip finds himself experiencing something else entirely, a psychedelic trip of overwhelming magnitude, the results can be disastrous. Although I rarely encountered such individuals, there are pushers and handlers of drugs who, because of sadism or greed, intentionally adulterate or dilute the drugs which they vend. Because psychedelic drugs are illegal and must be sold underground, there is quite often little or no quality control employed in the process of their manufacture. The consequences of this for trippers can sometimes be fatal. Psychedelic drugs are, of course, illegal. Penalties, even for the possession of marijuana, are still heavy, and law enforcement officials seem to be taking great pains to enforce the law in this regard. Moreover, even if a raid should never materialize, the fear that it might happen at any moment can ruin trip after trip. A knock on the door, a gust of wind... A car going by outside can cause the tripper to recoil in horror. His closest friends are sometimes suspected of being narcotics agents. Whether it is true or not, the drug user may come to believe that his every move is being watched, that society is after him, that he is on the most wanted list of every civic-minded organization, that straits are just waiting for the opportunity to get their hands on him. Consequently, he spends a good deal of his time devising ways to elude the dreaded enemy, which in most cases is merely the figment of his fear-ridden imagination. Although some will consider this point unworthy of mention, psychedelic drugs are quite expensive, and inflation has by no means bypassed the drug market. Finally, there is the danger posed by flashbacks, this phenomenon is very complex and is rarely or never experienced by many, but nevertheless the possibility is always there. A sound, a sight, or a smell may stir up a memory, starting a process in the subconscious mind which brings back a previous psychedelic experience. In some cases, these flashbacks are relatively mild and pleasant, but there are other times, depending on the circumstance, when they can be inconvenient and even disastrous. In other words, what I am saying here is that psychedelic drugs are ultimately a dead end. They are certainly not the way of salvation for America and the Western world, which some originally thought them to be. Psychedelics can trigger an experience of increased life, or, on the other hand, they, they can trigger an experience of increased death. Depending on the state of consciousness and the environmental influences present, a psychedelic drug can catalyze an experience of indescribable bliss or a nightmare of unspeakable horror. Psychedelics have provided the most pleasant but also the most painful experiences of my life. They are not a panacea. They are not the magic fruit of the tree of life which can return man to the Garden of Eden. They can provide what some have described as visions of the garden, but they cannot open the gate. They cannot provide the life experience suggested by the vision. With psychedelic drugs, there is a continual reliance on something coming in from the outside to give a sense of beauty and fulfillment. 
a psychedelic drug, though forcing a temporary withdrawal from the narcotic of the conditioned mind, is nevertheless still a narcotic itself. For there is still a dependence on something from the outside to generate life which in reality is self-generating. Many young people of the new generation have discarded the narcotics used by their parents, television sets, sleeping pills, split-level homes, alcohol, moonwalks, and an assorted religious nostrum, only to substitute narcotics of their own. Crash pads, protest movements, acid rock, Jesus worship, floor-length hair, and psychedelic drugs. Of course, not one of these things is a narcotic in and of itself. They only become so when individuals, unaware of who they really are, rely on them for identity and significance. When the attitude is taken that repeated inputs of such things are necessary for the experience of increased life. The process needs to be reversed for both generations, and this is where ontology comes in. In other words, what I am saying is that there is an alternative to psychedelic drugs. It is the only answer to the drug problem. There is an alternative to the senseless stuffing of ourselves with the things of the environment, hoping thereby to gain fulfillment. It is the only answer to the problem, so-called problem, of living. It begins with a simple recognition that we are already filled full of everything that is needed for the experience of life, and that we need something from the outside of ourselves to be fulfilled. Life in all of its fullness is already within every person on the face of the earth, just waiting to be released, and psychedelic drugs are not needed to stir up these living waters to get them flowing. In fact, we will begin to experience the flow in us and through us the moment we cease to think that something from the outside is needed to get it going. And so the drug problem, as is the case with all of the problems of the human race, is a problem ultimately of identity. Unable to discover their identity in society, which strikes them as phony and sterile, Many young adults have used psychedelic drugs to explore alternative identity patterns. Their exhilarating experiences in a psychedelic world of bright colors and beautiful sounds confirms their conviction that something else is possible, that there is something more to life than what they see around them in an ordinary state of awareness. But they come to discover that these experiences cannot be sustained beyond the duration of the trip, that they are sometimes very unpleasant, and that they must pay for them not only with their money but with their minds and with their bodies. The visions and the feelings remain in their memories. They know that for an hour or a day, they experienced a return to paradise, and their eyes still light up as over coffee they reminisce about the beautiful days gone by. But the identity crisis remains. For a moment they lived as though they had returned to the garden, as though they had returned to the truth of who they are. But because this truth never entered the conscious mind, the experience could only be artificially induced by a tablet of acid or a joint of marijuana. Until the truth of our identity is brought forth into the conscious awareness and is allowed to control in this area, we shall forever be reduced to the expedient of manufacturing our highs with narcotics from the environment. Here is the secret to movement out of a psychedelic or any other narcotic pattern. The truth vaguely sensed in the fleeting visions of a narcotic experience can never materialize in a consistent pattern of life until an individual begins to consciously choose life from moment to moment. In other words, there must be action, informed action not blind groping through a fog of emotional impressions. There must be something which can hold life on course, something to which the conscious mind can orient, 
a key with which it is possible to accurately integrate and translate the exalted yet undefined sense of life born of vision into the concrete reality born of informed action. Why haven't the magnificent visions generated by the art and culture of the new generation materialized in actual expressions of life strong and consistent enough to bring a new age into form on earth? Simply because the key by which vision might be translated into reality has remained for the most part undiscovered. Very few have either had the integrity or the perception to actually follow through on their vision. Those who at one time had the vision have generally ended up doing one of three things. Number one, betraying or forgetting the vision and gradually slipping back into the old state. Number two, endeavoring to repeat again and again the experiences which gave them the vision. Or, number three, searching high and low for the key which will enable them to translate vision into reality, but in most cases settling for an imperfect translation. Now those in the third category have generally employed a variety of concepts, systems, and life patterns to translate their sense of life into a pattern of action. Such things as Zen disciplines, yoga, reformulations of traditional Christianity, macrobiotics and an assortment of social and political philosophies have all been used with limited success, limited because each is based on a limited view of humanity. The good news, indeed the glorious news that I am bringing you, is that the key has been found the key by which a complete and perfect translation may be made of all that man in his most magnificent moments has envisioned himself to be, this key has been found. Of course, the truth is that the key was never lost, except in the consciousness of humanity. But now a brilliant shaft of light has pierced the cloudy atmosphere of that consciousness and human beings, after groping around for centuries in the dark wilderness of an unreal world, imbibing the narcotics of false identity, may now return by the clear light of truth to the promised land for which human beings were created. Every person on the face of this earth has within himself or herself everything that is needed for the generation of a psychedelic experience. In other words, chemicals from the outside are totally unnecessary. Just as no scientist can successfully create life in a laboratory, no drug user can successfully create life in his own being. There simply needs to be the increased expression of the life that is already present. No psychedelic drug can create or increase life. It can only, in certain instances and for a limited period of time, thin the veil of perception so that a few faint patches of the light which has always been present are permitted to reach the corridors of darkened understanding. But the plain fact is that the experience of light and the creative release of life are possible in every moment by purely natural means. Those who think they are going to get it all together by dropping acid, by moving to a mountain commune, by reading the Tibetan Book of the Dead, by listening to rock music, maybe by overthrowing the government or by settling down with a soulmate, they're just deluding themselves. Of course, many are inclined to think that they need to explore these areas and pass through these experiences in order to come to the point where they can actually let go to the truth of who they really are. But why waste any more time and energy in what is usually a very painful and frustrating search for self-identity? There is a way home, and it is found not by proving out one by one the emptiness of all of the human methods of arriving at truth, but by simply beginning to be the truth in expression. Following the light of inner being, living according to one's highest vision of the truth in each moment, the trusting soul can be brought out of the darkness of Egypt into a land flowing with milk and honey, 
the promised land where heaven and earth are one. The only key which is adequate to the nature of man, the only key by which vision may be fully translated into the reality of a new age on earth, is in the pattern of life which has been described as ontology. Ontology, defined as the art and science of true being, provides for every dimension of man and the universe in which he lives. The basic laws and principles by which all things are constituted, when these are permitted clear expression in an individual, they direct the conscious mind on a course of informed action, permitting the raw material of heaven recognized as already present in each individual, to come into manifest form on earth. And so the use of psychedelics, even in a deliberate and systematic program of meditation and self-discovery, such as that suggested in Timothy Leary's and Ralph Metzner's volume, The Psychedelic Experience, is still very dangerous. It's very haphazard, and ultimately it is a futile undertaking. Now, this is not to deny, of course, that certain insights about the self and the nature of life can occasionally be derived from this approach, but as a method of effecting an actual and permanent change in the level of life, the approach must fail, because too little attention is given to what the book significantly describes as, quote, game existence, the ordinary processes of life apart from the psychedelic experience. The goal seems to be that of leaving the things of the earth behind, including the body and the ego consciousness, and moving into the clear light of reality, the heavenly state of nirvana, which is deliverance from the wheel of life. For example, after the high of a psychedelic experience, as the process of re-entry begins, the admonition is given, quote, use your foresight to choose a good post-session robot, unquote. The implication here seems to be that day-to-day -day life on earth is nothing but a game to be played mechanically and viewed with staid detachment, something which needs to be consistently transcended in a psychedelic state of awareness until illumination and liberation are permanently realized in a state of mystical union with the whole. This process aside from the guidance which may be given by a guru, is generally an individual matter. It takes place almost entirely in the mind as an act of meditation and contemplation, and it is directed toward a heaven that is not of this earth. In other words, despite claims of union with the whole, it stands in actual fact as a rather narrow and exclusive thing. In relegating life on earth to, quote, game existence, unquote, there is a tendency toward dualism and ethereality, an artificial separation of heaven and earth. But most significantly, certain dimensions of the human being are either belittled or entirely disregarded. For example, what is the body in this scheme of things except excess baggage? What of the rational mind? What of the human will? What of human relationships or the earthly plane? Is there anything to this imperative, love thy neighbor? What of rocks? What of trees? What of animals? What of life on earth? The art and science of true being is anything but narrow and confining. Can anything be conceived of which does not possess the property of being. Being includes both heaven and earth, both contemplation and action, both man and his neighbor. In other words, it encompasses all. A human being is rightly concerned with letting the things of heaven come into the earth rather than with putting aside the things of the earth that heaven might be realized. Heaven is not limited to the end product of a disciplined state of meditation or the fleeting ecstasy of a psychedelic experience. Heaven may be experienced in drinking a Coke, washing the laundry, adding a column of figures, driving a car, or engaging in sexual intercourse. 
Heaven is experienced on earth whenever a form is filled with the spirit of life expressing through an individual. The sphere of the manifestation of heaven is none other than the earth. And until this is recognized, human beings will continue to bend, distort, muddle, and empty their minds with drugs, Zen disciplines, religious dogmas, in misguided and pathetic attempts to locate the very thing in which they live and move and have their being. We sometimes, in other words, fail to see the salt shaker because it is right in front of us. The many in our generation who have embarked on the pathway of Eastern mystical religion have some recognition of the need to be centered in the one within. But so often there is the failure to remember that the basic purpose of life is the unfoldment of the one in the many, not the absorption or annihilation of the many by the one. It is not getting out of the earth into heaven, but letting the things of heaven come into the earth. As with oriental meditation, ontology involves a centering process, a means by which an individual is awakened and attuned to the presence of the divine within him. But it simultaneously moves beyond this to a creative outworking with respect to the earth. The spring of life generated in the realm of spirit, flowing through men and women who have opened the channels of the divine, is released into the earth, and the kingdom of heaven and earth, the kingdom of heaven on earth, begins to take form. The general pattern of human experience is one of high and low, up and down, individuals fluctuating with their moods. Human beings in false identity will do anything within their means to surround themselves with environments that make them feel good. This may mean summering in the north and wintering in the south, Saturday night at the movies and Sunday afternoon in the park, a cup of coffee at 10 o'clock in the morning and a cocktail before dinner, or if bad moods hang on too long, an unscheduled vacation to Florida, a visit to the neighborhood psychiatrist, a miraculous conversion in the big gospel tent, or experimentation with mood-altering agents such as pep pills, tranquilizers, and, God forbid, psychedelic drugs. My own disastrous bad trip recorded earlier is a dramatic illustration of the failure of such an attempt. All such reactions are fear reactions. The person is so identified with his moods that he experiences the possibility of their dominion, their domination, and he is not sure that he has anything within himself to cope with them, and so he spends his days and his years in meaningless escape patterns, deluding himself and others that he is experiencing something more significant than death on the installment plan. But within an ontological centering pattern, an individual begins to touch the resources within himself that can handle everything in the environment. As he begins to live in attunement, with the eternally radiating center of his own being, he is delivered from the bondage of moods, and he no longer feels the need to run from anything. No clouds entering the consciousness can obscure the sun from view. Every situation and every mood, whether pleasant or unpleasant, is handled positively and creatively in the current of the spirit. Now, of course, I'm aware that the use of a psychedelic drug in conjunction with a process of meditation has also been recommended as a means of acquainting a person with his inner resources. But even if a person at the height of a psychedelic experience should happen to enter the Holy of Holies, the center of his own being, little or no provision is made for the sustained expression of life beyond the duration of the trip. The things of God which were touched upon during the experience are not held tenaciously and constantly in consciousness, perhaps because the conscious mind was denied participation in the experience. 
The psychedelic experience is a high with the process of re-entry there returns the possibility of a low from which an individual may think he needs to escape with another high. The worldly lows need to be balanced by the heavenly highs. There is no sustained expression of life. The things of heaven are not brought into the earth, and the same old subhuman pattern of up and down, high and low, is maintained. There is sometimes mention of the experience of being spaced out, by which it is usually meant that a person is, in some sense, dwelling in the astral plane, touching spiritual or psychic things, living in a condition of prolonged attunement with something within. Those who do a lot of psychedelic drugs, making psychedelics a central focus in their life pattern, gradually begin to function in a spaced-out condition. They are no longer aware of going up or coming down. This was my experience during a 15-day period in 1969 when I either smoked or dropped something every day. I arrived at the point of being on a 24-hour-a-day high, and this spaced-out state continued for a week beyond the 15-day period when I wasn't doing any drugs at all. During this time, I lived as though I was in a daze. Eating, sleeping, working, thinking became irrelevant, and everything seemed to take on a timeless quality. Day and night didn't matter anymore. All I wanted to do was listen to music, dance, and rap with friends. It was, in some ways, a very pleasant and beautiful experience, there was a certain sense of attunement with spiritual realities. But as I settled deeper and deeper into it, my mental and emotional state became more and more muddled. Clarity of awareness, though keener in some areas, became fainter in others. I began to feel certain unpleasant body sensations, and I had a gnawing awareness that I was slowly turning into a vegetable. There was a realization that my increase of contact with the internal realities was being paid for by the loss of contact with external realities, that in gaining a kind of heaven, I was actually losing the earth. The heavy user of psychedelics may attain a semblance of spiritual attunement and avoid something of the usual high and low pattern of human life as he gradually becomes spaced out in the world of psychedelia. But it comes at the great expense of his rational mind and his physical body. After a period of time, the condition of being spaced out becomes the condition of being wiped out or wasted. The outer capacities through which life needs to express in order for it to be fully known in any real complete sense, these capacities become burned out. They become useless and they die. The person who makes psychedelics, even marijuana, an integral part of his life pattern, eventually, in other words, blows his mind in a very literal sense. The average human mind is not capable of withstanding a continuous state of psychedelic intensity. Consistent and prolonged application of the principles of ontology, on the other hand, enables the mind to regain its capacity to handle the enormous flows of life from spirit. If the user should take an overdose or experience one or more bummers, he may freak out and blow his mind even sooner. With the loss of his outer capacities of heart, emotion, mind and body, the psychedelic drug user, even if he has acquired a sort of spiritual awareness, becomes a vegetable whose further life on earth is pointless. Far better that heaven and earth be one, that the capacities of heart, mind and body be retained and even enlarged for the ever-expanding expression of life flowing from within. In other words, there is a way of constant attunement with spirit that does not require the use of psychedelic drugs or disciplined meditation exercises. 
there is a way to a sustained expression of life such that a person is no longer subject to the rise and fall of his emotions or the state of his environment. There is a way to what might be called a divine space out, in which a person lives out of spirit, grows with spirit, creates with spirit, and is in need of nothing, be it chemicals, yoga, music, nature, or good people, for the sustained expression of life. It is the way of ontology. A person cannot drop a psychedelic drug or spend a day in meditation every time he needs to be reminded of who he is, to be connected up with the spiritual source within himself. Moreover, a psychedelic drug trip, because it involves in varying degrees the loss of ego consciousness and the rational mind, leaves an individual particularly vulnerable to his environment. The correct approach can only be one in which the conscious mind deliberately chooses life in every moment. During a psychedelic experience, an individual is, in a sense, forced to do this. His ego consciousness is pushed out of the way so that it is less able to impede the flow of life. But of course, when he comes down, ego consciousness returns, and because it is unaccustomed to freely choosing the life source, it is apt to interfere again with the flow. And so the only way of return to what I would call the garden state is by way of conscious and consistent practice of the art and science of true being. Since the response of the individual in this recreative process is on a totally voluntary basis all the way through, it cannot, therefore, involve the suppression of any of our faculties of willing, thinking, and feeling. Unbalanced and splintered people simply will not populate the restored state on earth. As the individual makes a conscious choice of life again and again, a habit pattern is established and eventually the choice of life becomes more natural than the choice of a narcotic from the forbidden tree. With his capacities of heart, mind, and body firmly yet freely centered in spirit, indeed firm because they are free, the individual returns to his proper place in the design of the whole and becomes an open channel for the flow of spirit into the earth. Note that this centering process is not something which occurs on an abstract intellectual plane. It is not something which a person gets through reading, meditation, or psychedelic experiences, or service on a social action committee. It is the nature of life to give. And so a person experiences life only as he gives it. It is when he is no longer occupied with attempts to snare blessings for himself from the environment and is concerned only with being a blessing to everyone and everything around him that he begins to know life in abundance. It is not so much that an ontological person no longer feels that what is customarily described as a high or low it is just that he no longer identifies with neither of these things. He realizes that he is not what he feels because he is spaced out or perhaps spaced in would be a more appropriate term because in other words he is in constant attunement with that which is vibrationally higher. He is no longer in bondage to moods, to circumstances and emotional states. These no longer control him. The expression of life is sustained through a low. And the low, receiving no power from personal identification with it, either dissipates or becomes a golden opportunity for the further expression of life. The ontologist wastes no time fighting, resisting, or running from the low with such devices as tranquilizers, pleasant diversions, religious nostrums, psychedelic drugs, or the like. 
The law is embraced, enfolded, and used by life for its purposes. Loneliness and depression, described by one poet as a string of dirty days, simply cannot touch the person who flies above the clouds. But neither does an ontologist identify with a high, even though as he begins to live in harmony with the true nature of life, he is likely to experience highs of greater intensity and longer duration than ever before. Some have felt that because he is bound to being, ever centered in the one within, an ontologist is no longer capable of experiencing a high in relationship to the environment. Well, exactly the opposite is true, of course. He is certainly not controlled, or I should say concerned with getting a high by acquiring a sports car or swallowing a pill, for he recognizes that no high has its origin in the world of phenomena. But because he is concerned with giving freely of the life within him, letting it flow into the environment as a blessing to others, the windows of heaven are ever opened in blessing upon him. He knows, in the truest sense, the good life. The experience of a beautiful natural setting, be it a lush green valley or a rugged mountain peak, dissipates the clouds of consciousness and opens wide the channels of life so that it literally flows in a torrent and comes back in even greater measure. We have all had poetic experiences with things of beauty in the environment. But these moments of ecstasy are not initiated and maintained by anything from the outside as if an object had in and of itself the power of life. They only come as life is released through us into the created world. We do not get a high from the environment. We give ourselves a high by opening wide the channel of spirit. A snow-covered mountain peak has no meaning or power of evoking ecstasy except that which is given it by the essences of life moving through a human being. One ceases for the duration of the experience to block the natural life flow of the self-active mind. A person who reaches the point of total insensitivity to the movement of spirit within him will not experience a high no matter how beautiful his environment. He is among what I would call the walking dead. Narcotics users employ chemicals and other toxic substances to push aside and sometimes crush the conscious mind so that it can no longer block the flow of life. The ontologist, on the other hand, is able to relax into the natural control of spirit because it is self-active rather than self-active. I should say self with a capital S, self-active, rather than self with a lower S, self-active. Because of that, the conscious mind offers no resistance to that which is coming out of heaven into the earth. Consequently, there is no need for chemicals or any other external contrivance or technique to manufacture a condition of attunement with spirit. Although the term natural high has for many a somewhat unsavory taste by virtue of its association with the Jesus movement and other religious patterns, it is still perhaps the best description of the ontological experience because he recognizes that these highs are an inside rather than an outside job, something which he gives rather than gets, the ontologist experiences them in greater measure than those who don't know who they are. But though they may enjoy them, he does not on this account identify with them, for he always remembers that the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was pleasing to the eye, but deadly to the soul. All things are returned graciously and joyfully to the life source from which they came. When a person begins to live in this way, the old distinction between the sacred and the secular disappears. Heaven and earth are one. 
so-called secular activities such as work, sex, and education are perceived as sacred activities, providing ideal opportunities for the expression of life. Moments stretch into eternity as the outer capacities clear to permit a fuller manifestation of spirit in form. The essential perfection of all things is seen and known as the body temple and everything round about is filled with the glory of being. In order for ontology to make an impact in relation to the drug problem, it must actually be proposed as an alternative. There must be a willingness to take it seriously and to follow through with all of the procedures that may be necessary for its germination and growth in a particular area. It is also important to realize that it must be an inside job, that it must begin within individuals and work outward from there rather than with structures and organizations, hoping that changes in an outer sense will automatically produce changes desired in an inner sense in the individual. Of course, programs offering guidance are necessary, but the primary emphasis should always be given to that which needs to happen within the individual. And what needs to happen within the individual is no less than a complete change of outlook. In fact, the death of the old self and the birth of the new. He must be freed from the bonds of prior conditioning. False identity patterns, which formerly provided a sense of meaning and security, need to pass away to permit the coming of the new. What this implies in a practical sense is a process of reconditioning in which each person is systematically and carefully re-educated to the truth of his own being. The intransigence of the conditioned self necessitates a transition period the length of which will depend upon the strength of past conditioning and the individual's willingness to move out of it. The new must, in many cases, be introduced gradually, lest the person cling all the more tenaciously to the old and experience something akin to a cold turkey process of narcotics withdrawal. This requires discretion in the selection and use of written materials and in the manner and content of verbal presentations, but above all else it requires teachers of profound sensitivity and patience. The movement is always from the known to the unknown. Rare is the person whose identity is so totally lost to the memory that there is virtually nothing which can serve as a beginning point for his re-education. But although initial contact is made with the known, there can be no previews of coming attractions, such that a person might make a decision about whether to continue in a pattern on the basis of present likes and dislikes. It is recognized that a person who is forever anticipating the future is never fully alive in the present moment, and that any plans devised by a self-centered human ego can only crystallize the expression of being and reduce life to something far less than the creative adventure that it naturally is. The principles of ontology cannot be put into a textbook and taught in typical classroom fashion, nor can they be reduced to concepts that are readily assimilated by the intellect. For the principles have no meaning apart from their application in the day-to-day -day processes of living. An entire pattern of life needs to develop, something that involves every thought, every word, every act. Frequent meetings and study periods may be needed to keep these principles constantly before the conscious mind, but the necessity for their actual application must be stressed above all else. And it is in this area that beginning students of ontology may experience the greatest difficulty, especially if they must live in conditions where distorted patterns are well developed and entrenched insufficiently grounded in the truth of themselves to withstand the pressures of the world, 
they are likely to return to former patterns or go beyond them to patterns of even greater distortion. Consequently, it is helpful to the person making the transition from the old to the new to live in a context where the expression of true being is constantly stimulated and reinforced. So how fortunate it is that there are now a number of small communities, some of which outwardly take the form of ranches or farms, where this is possible, where a harmonious vibrational atmosphere, as free as possible of the interference of distorted expressions, is consistently maintained, so that there might be an open and uninhibited expression of the truth of identity lest the young plant fail to take root or be choked out by the cares of the world, how essential it is to spend as much time as possible in the presence of those in whom the truth of being is manifested on a continuing basis. The provision of small communities, of ontological centers in various cities, of special training classes, and most importantly, of capable leaders and teachers permits a foundation to be laid quite quickly and easily. To educate in the true sense is to draw forth, and it is the consistent demonstration of the artistry of living both in and out of the classroom by those who are expert in this area that draws forth the highest qualities of divine character in each individual. Transforming 20, 40 and 60 year old children into mature men and women and making possible a new age of creative experience on earth. Every day is full of new tests and opportunities which need to be met with the resources of true being. The invitation is constantly given to grow, to evolve, to become an active participant in the creative cycles of the cosmos, to bring heaven into form on earth. But this can only happen as an individual steadfastly cultivates the habit of choosing life from one moment to the next. For the consciousness to remain properly centered at all times, there is a need in the beginning for continual reminders of the truth, whether these be in the form of community centering services or private meditations. In order for the subconscious mind to be cleared of distorted patterns and filled with the pure water of truth, the conscious mind must be virtually inundated with the forms of truth which it is capable of assimilating on the basis of its present understanding of what is right and fitting. But if, after this initial cleansing has taken place, there is a return to the former things, a recurrence of preoccupation with phenomena, the purifying work of spirit will be undone in short order and the latter state may be worse than the first. So there must be moment by moment centering in the truth of identity. Any number of forms may provide a suitable context for this centering to be accomplished. The important thing, of course, is that it is accomplished but all of this without coercion. To the extent that response is forced by external pressures, the individual is not actually participating in his own salvation, and to the extent that he is not freely participating, he is not really getting it together at all. There is no penetration beneath the surface. The point must be reached where, like the prodigal son in the parable, he desires with all of his heart to return to the Father, and thus to himself. Having consumed enough of his substance in riotous living, he must, as the prodigal son did, come to himself, that is, come to his own senses, and begin to freely respond out of love for the truth. And finally, it must be emphasized that movement and growth in an ontological pattern cannot be merely an individual matter. A single individual trying to go it alone in private study and meditation may acquire an intellectual understanding, 
and possibly experience something of the meaning of divine function, but the full experience and the full knowing come only to those who have a relatedness to the emerging divine community on earth. Even in the self-centered world, the energy field of two people operating in agreement is considerably greater than that of two individuals attempting to function on their own. Man is man only really in community, and until there is a connecting up with the whole, and more specifically with the body of men and women who must authentically represent the whole on earth, the veil shrouding God in mystery will remain thick and opaque. These, then, are some of the practical things that need to be considered in implementing an ontological pattern. It should be evident that only those forms and structures which are living channels for the flow of life have any usefulness in such a pattern. The human tendency has been to let forms become so entrenched in systems and institutions that the creative activity of life is stifled. Forms are perpetuated and worshipped long after their usefulness to life has ended. But life is an ever-changing creative dynamic, and therefore, to paraphrase Paul in his letter to the Corinthians in the New Testament, anyone who would move with life must become an entirely new person, letting old things pass away and all things become constantly new. Narcotics from color TV to drugs represent the pitiful attempt by man to get the very things which are freely given to him. Narcotics destroy the outer capacities of body, mind, and heart, the very capacities by which the things of heaven may come into the earth so that heaven and earth may be one. Ontology, the art and science of being, is the alternative to narcotics, the art and science of stuffing. Giving is the alternative to getting. Living is the alternative to dying. The pattern of life suggested in these pages is the answer, not just to the drug problem, but to every problem that has ever beset the human race. Every person on the face of this earth is already filled full of everything needed for fulfillment. This is true now, and it always has been true, and it always will be true. And so, let it be.